So uh, you're hearing a lot about the big data uh, in every aspect of our lives and how it can inform on you know, a whole range of things, whether it's climate or air traffic control or your own personal health. And of course, the, the big problem is you know, how do we deal with all that information? And we see it, you know, particularly in the life sciences, just accelerating at a, an amazing pace. And here's just a curve of, of the cost of genome sequencing over the last decade plus uh, 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 and, and what you're seeing, the white line is a Moore's Law curve, and so you're seeing the cost of sequencing drop at the super Moore's Law rate, and that's driving this revolution of being able to generate data on unbelievable scales. And of course, we're uh, not just doing that in the omics dimension in the biomedical life sciences, we're also doing it in the clinical arenas. Uh, so places like Mount Sinai, where we have a large clinical uh, repository, uh, electronic medical record system, where we have a half a million to a million patient visits a year, and all those transactions are getting uh, stored. And what we uh, want to do is accumulate all this information. So we're generating, you know, from that at multiple scales. So the institute uh, we have at Mount Sinai is the the Genomics and Multiscale Biology Institute because the scales are you know, looking at the molecular dimensions to cellular, to tissue, uh, organ, to organism, to ecosystem. We want to be operating at all those scales and how is information flowing between those levels. Uh, this is just to depict how at the molecular level these data are, uh, are interacting with one another. They're not interacting in simple linearly ordered pathways that the textbooks might like you to believe. They're highly nonlinear. They're interacting in, in what forms networks, and these networks form networks of networks to define the complexity of these, uh, these living systems. And if we want to understand biology and the true complexity of disease, we need to be thinking at this more network-based uh, level. And once we understand some of these networks, we can get away from single gene views or single metabolites, so vitamin C, vitamin D. We can, we can look more holistically in how perturbations in these molecular states can affect different parts of the system. Here, going on in a single cell or tissue type, uh, but we're more, more complicated than a single cell or tissue type. Right? We're made up of lots of different organs, and so we have to be thinking about how is the communication going on through the whole system, because the way we operate isn't uh, 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 at the single cell level. This amazing machine is, is uh, highly integrated, and so we have to be able to model how this information is flowing between cells, between tissues, and throughout the entire organism, and ultimately to uh, entire ecosystems. So that's our goal, and uh, one of the technologies I helped develop with Pacific Biosciences was a single molecule real-time sequencer. So this is just the amazingness of technology that's driving this revolution of big data in the, in the life sciences. And what we're able to do at this point is look at a single molecule of, uh, in this case, DNA polymerase while it's synthesizing a strand of DNA. So that's the sequencer, and, and the amount of information that comes from that is about 100 times bigger than the kind of sequencing data that occurs today, because you're picking up all this kinetic information of how the polymerase is interacting with that DNA, which provides lots of additional information. And of course, we don't have to isolate to just one molecule at a time. We can multiplex over many tens of thousands or into the hundreds of thousands of these uh, molecules at a time, and simultaneously generating all of this uh, information. And one of the things we apply it to are in rapidly understanding uh, outbreaks of, say, infectious disease. So here, just showing you some of the hot zones that exist around the globe, where very horrific uh, infections occur, uh, kills lots of people. Infectious diseases are one of the leading killers, if not the leading killer in the world. And so can we use this kind of technology to rapidly um, elucidate outbreaks and, and help better treat and predict uh, those outbreaks? And so we applied this to uh, uh, cholera in Haiti, you might remember Haiti in 2010 had an earthquake, horrific event, followed by this cholera outbreak, another horrific event, many people killed. There was lots of uh, d uh, uh, discussion going on about where that came from, was it brought from afar, did it emerge from the waters of Haiti, uh, and so on. So we were able to get literally samples uh, from Haiti with Matt Wilder at Harvard uh, on, a, on a day. The next day we had that sequence, the entire genome of the cholera bug that was causing that infection uh, uh, sequenced, in addition to five other strains that exist at different uh, geographic regions around the world, uh, and analyzed the data the next day, wrote a paper the next day, had that submitted to New England Journal, and three to four weeks after we collected samples from Haiti, we had a paper online in the New England Journal describing uh, that particular bug. So it was one of these, you know, being on a rocket ship type experiences. And uh, what we were able to tell from that uh, rapid uh, information gathering and analysis was achieving some understanding about where that bug came from. And our data pointed very strongly to not 
that bug didn't emerge from the waters of Haiti. It actually came there from afar, most likely from south uh, east uh, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and uh, that has significant implications, implications for how you might treat that disease. For example, if it's not endemic to the area, you might want to vaccinate aggressively to prevent it from becoming endemic in the region. So those questions uh, matter a lot. We did the same sort of game with the E. coli outbreak in Germany. You might, might remember that back in June 2011. We again, very, uh, and the, the problem with that particular bug is it was uh, uh, very, very virulent. The kind of serotype that uh, that bacteria reflected when they first analyzed it had never been seen to be so virulent. But this bug was actually killing people. There are 900 people in Germany today that are on dialysis awaiting kidney transplant because of this infection. So we again sequenced that bug in addition to lots of other strains uh, that had the same serotype as that bug to try to understand how did this become so virulent and how are we going to best treat, uh, treat this particular form. So we again had a paper in New England Journal on this very, very quickly. Uh, again, sort of unprecedented speed of the science if you have the right analytical engine to pull that information in and analyze it. And we not only uncovered sort of why it was becoming so virulent from this rapid exchange, horizontal transfer of virulence factors and antibiotic factors from different bugs that it was intermingling with, uh, but we also found that uh, how you treat that, that this particular bug, not only would it be resistant to antibiotic treatment, but it would actually, certain antibiotics like Cipro would activate the, the toxin gene that actually makes you sick. And this just showing uh, what we had in our paper, the, the large bar is uh, the activation of the toxin gene in the presence of Cipro. So this uh, showing you that you don't want to treat with Cipro because not only will it be resistant, but it's going to make you a lot sicker. Uh, so we have efforts going on right now, both in the Bay Area and uh, New York, to apply this kind of technology to detect these outbreaks before they occur by sampling in regions like, uh, like an SFO airport where you may see bugs flux in, uh, whether it's flu or West Nile virus or, or just think of uh, anything, or, or they show up in your neighborhood food store or restaurant. You know, being able to track that in real time, sequencing all of that same day, and looking at infectious agents as they flux into an area and spread over the region over time can we become better at uh, preventing the, the sorts of outcomes that, that we face today from these sorts of infections. In addition, though, we want to not only look at infectious disease, we want to see how these, all these interacting factors affect uh, the organism that uh, uh, we like to think about today, the humans, from the standpoint of disease and drug response. So here, just showing you the, all the different dimensions of data. David talked nicely about it. All these different dimensions that you can, you can monitor, and we ultimately want to integrate that information. We want to generate, here showing you a paper we had recently in PLOS Biology on just integrating DNA variation, RNA variation, metabolite levels, protein interaction, protein DNA binding, protein uh, uh, small molecule interaction, all of these different d data domains under a unified mathematical framework, very much like uh, uh, in the spirit of what GNS Healthcare does and uh, many other companies, IOSD, uh, all sort of focused on this big data integration to do something useful, predict something that, that can uh, help treat and diagnose disease. So out of this come our predictive models, right? We want to be able to predict things. And here I'm showing you from one of the studies we carried out, uh, this is uh, 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 about uh, 800 patients that were undergoing bariatric uh, surgery, so morbidly obese, and we looked at omental fat and sub-Q fat and stomach and liver, molecularly profiled all of that, the RNA, we profiled the DNA, and applied Bayesian network uh, inference algorithms to this where we uh, treated DNA variation as a systematic perturbation source to make causal inference. This is the network that results. And one of the cool things about once you have these sorts of networks, now we can start projecting all the different disease conditions uh, like asthma, COPD, Alzheimer's, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, breast cancer, all of these different diseases where we can generate signatures of what's happening in the body at the molecular level and project them onto these networks. And what we found through all of these different diseases is that a particular network, you know, mental fat, those nodes that are highlighted in pink, were consistently showing up over and over again across every single one of those diseases as causal for the disease. So here's sort of a common mechanism affecting a broad range of diseases, again, from obesity, diabetes, to Alzheimer's, to COPD, to asthma, to all different sorts of cancer, IBD, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on, but finding a very critical network. Now, now we can go into that network since it's a probabilistic causal uh, uh, framework, and we can see how these different nodes, how these different genes are connected causally so that we can understand how, how to intervene in the system, how to perturb it to affect the state of that network to transition it into a better state. 
And so I'll just finish with a couple of examples of how we've applied this and come up with novel discovery. Here showing you that same network, the nodes highlighted in pink. I'm showing you the network here. And now we're systematically in silico going through and perturbing all of the nodes on the computer to understand what happens if we punch this gene down or up. What happens to the state of the network and how do we predict it will affect disease. And the one highlight I'm showing you here is a gene PPM1L. It was a gene that was a sort of a central regulator in that network. When we, when we punched it in silico, it had a broad effect on that network. And what it's showing you is red is your down, green is your up. And so our model said if you downregulate PPM1L, you're going to upregulate insulin, downregulate glucose, very good for diabetes, but you're also going to increase fat mass, and you're also going to downregulate genes that are involved in hypertension to give higher cardiovascular risk. So we're able to see more holistically all the benefits and liability of targeting that uh, particular gene. And uh, here we're just showing you the experimental validation where when we experiment, so remember that was all done in the computer. We could go through in a matter of minutes and understand what each gene was going to do and which one we might want to use to target. In PPM1L, we made all those predictions. And here you're looking at the actual experimental validations. What did we find? We found that it lowered glucose, just like we said it would. But the other curve in the middle is showing you different fat masses of animals that have the gene knocked down versus up, and they get fatter, just as we predicted. And then we also saw increases in blood pressure, just as we predicted. But remember, we did that all in silico. And the interesting thing is when we look at what PPM1 uh, uh, sits next to in the network, it sits close to PPAR gamma. PPAR gamma, we know, is a, is a target of rosiglitazone, the market, or Vandia, the marketed form of rosiglitazone. And what do we know? So our prediction in, in a paper that was published long before these clinical studies came out was that if you start messing with that part of the network, you, you might lower glucose, but you're going to increase cardiovascular risk and you're going to increase fat. And, uh, and then what do we know about uh, the clinical studies that came out two years after our paper? And this is from giving the drug to people. We found out that rosiglitazone treatment makes you fatter, lowers your glucose, and it increases your cardiovascular risk. But again, that had to be found by actually giving somebody the drug and watching the glucose get lowered and watching the increased risk of, of uh, heart attacks occur versus doing it all in silico and predicting that uh, 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 without the human outcome. And so just to finish, uh, we're sort of in this mode now where we're able to take these networks and actually define the different states of the system through the, through the probability structure that emerges from, from all the integration of this data. And we can actually, these different mountains in this uh, uh, energy phase space, reflect different states of a system that the contours that go between them are the actual gene constellations that we know quantitatively how to knock down or up to move from one state to the other. So once we start getting at this engineering within biology where we can do simulations, we can run these sorts of things uh, in silico without having to do all the experimentation to better direct the experimentation in the lab or in clinic clinical studies and, and so on. So I think it's a truly exciting time. We need lots of uh, others to help you know, evolve these models, but, uh, but there it is. So I wanted to thank you for your attention. Lots of people involved in this work from PacBio for the infectious disease, all the academic centers helping with the, the cohorts and validation and so on. So it's a, a truly phenomenal group I've gotten to work with. So thank you.